Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 704. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is November 30th, 2021. All right, welcome to another program. Not just another program. This is the post-Thanksgiving program of Anglican Unscripted. George and I had a wonderful Thanksgiving dinner uh, with our families together at Seasons 52 in Tampa. I think I ate too much. There's a possibility, George, that I engorged and feasted. And uh, turkey is clearly one of my favorite foods at Seasons 52. Have you recovered? Yes, I have. But uh, Kevin, remember one of the things that you and I noticed, and I think it's a sign of our age, we've become aware for the first time of the amount of women who've had plastic surgery. (laughs) I think it's Tampa. (laughs) But there is a certain age and a certain look or uh, um, income level with which plastic surgery seems to be popular. And yeah, we walked out of that restaurant uh, after enjoying our Thanksgiving dinner and like, really? Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> oh my. <laughs> you were not well served by your plastic surgeon. Yeah, you know, I just, no. I don't want to be judgmental, but. Uh, and, and I need, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm starting to sag a little. This weight loss has affected different parts of my I can use a tummy tuck if I, you know, but it's not going to happen. I'm too cheap that way. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun, though. Um, but the uh, holidays are over as far as Thanksgiving, and the life of the church continues. We've had our vestry meeting, budget meetings. Um, you painted your church because you have the bishop coming soon, right? Yeah, bishop's coming the uh, 12th. Uh, so the, we just spent $20,000 to repaint the exterior of the main building. Uh, we've installed uh, Stations of the Cross outdoors, spent a few thousand getting these imported from Belgium. Oh, wow. And these are being, I don't want to say welded in place, but they're bronze. And so the, the vestry is frightened that they'll be stolen by <laughs> scrap thieves. So I don't know how they're, they're putting them on really tight, but uh, it, it's fascinating. God you know, is providing, uh, if you look at the church, it's a hive of, act, hive of activity. Uh, everything is going great except for attendance. This last Omicron scare, I could really see it on Sunday. Uh, mm. the, the people who sort of have crept back in, we're all gone again, um, for at least in our little corner of the world. Okay, you are guilty because I was watching the live stream to our church service and I noticed half the church wasn't there. Of course, I wasn't there. But uh, the people who had slowly been coming back over the last uh, season of three or four months since we... You and I declared we were post-COVID, and so it should have happened. Um, thank you, Mr. Leaf Blower. Yeah, right here. Um, and so, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but apparently there's a light that says on air outside the RV, and they just got to bring the leaf blowers here. But, you know, we announced on the show back in March, it's post-COVID times, you can go back to church, and people have been slowly going back to church, slowly going back to church, to I think our attendance was easily 97, 98% of what it was pre-COVID. And you're doing that now to annoy me. He just, he walked all the way around the RV. This this is a sidewalk. You don't need to blow leaves here, whatever. And so, you know, they were coming back, they're coming back, and all we needed was a Delta scare and then an Omni, Omni how do you pronounce it, Omicron? Omicron. Omicron. Scare. And that's it. People stop going. Um, you, I think, Kevin, your your pastor or your rector up in Connecticut must be doing a fantastic job because I've not come anywhere near uh, pre-COVID numbers. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, the best, the best uh, we've ever done was maybe get up to two-thirds, but we've fallen back down about maybe 50 to 60% again. Mm-hmm. Um, might be because we're older, but that you know, I could everybody can think of excuses, yeah. but I, I, I but I think your, your, your church up in Connecticut should be very proud of itself for being able to recover so quickly. Yeah, what, I... what, what's hurt, what's hurt me is the marginals, the people, 
the people who were engaged with the church life, who were involved, who did more than just show up on Sunday, but were involved in Bible studies, ministries, they're back. It's the people that are on the margins uh, who I've like you trying to bring into the life of the church. They're not back. Those, those marginals. Uh, that's not a nice way to describe well, them. I think but it's accurate. Uh, every ch church has its core people. The core people who volunteer for ninety percent of all the activities, you know, and uh, I think the core people, largely around the nation, have been unaffected by their tenants in churches. But and I, you're right, marginal is probably not the best word. But the people who uh, we seek to come to our church aren't coming as frequently anymore because of COVID, and COVID has been that excuse. Now, COVID also changed everything. Kevin and his dear wife Jill live in an RV now. We, 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 you know, the, this is something COVID has allowed us to do, and we're not the only ones out there. There are going to be 120 million people going to campgrounds in 2022 by estimates, not full time, but uh, people have taken up re enjoying the outdoors and re enjoying what uh, their countries offer outside of being connected full-time in their houses because now they work from home and they got to get out or they're going to go crazy or uh, it's just so COVID. So, yeah, it, everything's changed and the church has to adapt uh, to this time, uh, but so do the, the people who want to worship. You need to show up at your church. Uh, Jill and I visit churches very frequently now. We, we do enjoy that, but we also... It, try to attend our online service every week too. It's it's a difficult world because uh, I don't think I've ever worked harder in the ministry than I have over the past year, and that increasing the number of services online and in person in person services, um, just the the hours spent. Um, in the past, you could sort of sort of see a relationship between on your return of your investment of time and energy, and we're not seeing that right now because what is the return on a parish for online services? Mm. Because there's no what for an in-person service. How do I know? I count one, two, three, four, five, and I know everybody's name. But for online services, what is a Facebook view? What is a YouTube view? It's three seconds or 30 seconds, you know, for a half hour worship service, is someone really worshiping with you mm -hmm. if they're a view or are they just somebody who can't close out of that, that page they open on their browser because uh, by accident they hit your church. Yeah. So there's, it's not a, it's not a life issue, threatening issue, but the old way of thinking is handicapping me, for instance, in trying to envision how to do church for a new society, a new generation, a new world. Um, it's hard for me to break out of the parameters of how I've done it for 30 years. And we, I think, and hopefully it's occurring more and more, but people need to start missing that type of fellowship and that type of worship. Uh, maybe we could do an advertising campaign for in-person Eucharist or in-person liturgy. There's gotta be some way that we can make up for the slack here. But our biggest problem is this this post-COVID time is in waves of fear. You know, we just went through Delta and we saw how uh, the nation, America, reacted to Delta. Okay, airline stocks, bottom. Healthcare stocks go up to the top. People lock themselves back in their homes again. The unvaccinated stay unvaccinated. The vax get more vax. And that's that's our reaction. Now we have Om Omicron, and it's the same thing. Stock market crashes, travel stocks you know, go to the bottom, health stocks go to the top. The unvaxxed stay unvaxxed, and the vaccinated get boosters. That's the what, one thing I've noticed uh, is that you know I I track. I'm a bit, I'm a believer in big data mm -hmm. uh, in for the congregation. Uh, tracking attendance by individuals and whatnot. And the, we had a group of people who would come twice a Sunday, uh, morning and evening. Uh, that's all gone. Mm -hmm. um, but even though it's the same person, they're, they're twice on that one day. It counts as two people, <laughs> if you will. 
And so the four times a month, people are not coming three times. The three times are coming two times. The two times are coming once a month, and the once a month are coming Christmas and Easter. So it's it's not that I have fewer people in terms of unique individuals coming through, but their engagement is not as powerful. But at the same time, on my on the pastoral side, loneliness is such is now a huge it's always been a big issue but it's, it's becoming stronger and stronger with the loneliness from lockdowns and isolation now in the past loneliness was resolved by being part of a community but the the the, the world is saying you can't be part of a community because you'll die of covid so we, we have all these contradictory things that i'm still trying to get my head around how as a church can I help bring the good news of Jesus Christ to these people and build a community of believers in where God has given me the job? Well, I think, and we still live in COVID confusion. Uh, Jill's sister came down. Uh, we're giving her the, the tour of Florida, but she showed up with her vaccination card, uh, a box of masks, her ID, with her uh, vaccination card because she had just come from New York City where to get into a restaurant, you had to show your vaccination card and your ID to match up the name and the and the vaccination to get in. She had to, do to go to the library, to the museums and everything in New York City was completely uh, set aside only for the vaccinated. Here in Florida, there is a no mask policy and you can go anywhere uh, restaurants, museums, uh, anything except a federal building and not wear a mask. And so there's no consistent message here, you know, certainly in our nation and, and across the world, as to how we should act in these times. We're 20 months into COVID and we still don't have a consistent message on the science behind it and how we should react without fear. And the science is contradictory because we're hearing different people promoting different things. Mm -hmm. Florida has one of the highest numbers of cases of COVID, but it's the third largest state. So, of course, it'll have more cases than Vermont. Mm -hmm. But it has the lowest proportion number of cases. Uh, well, if you compare it to New York State, which is roughly the same size, uh, Florida's numbers are vastly greater than New York's in terms of number of sick, number of deaths, control of the illness. Yet New York is probably the most heavy handed in the Northeast with COVID restrictions. Well, as you say here in Florida, uh, we don't need no stinking badges is the state. Well, I, I, I think you screwed up what you're saying there. You, you're saying that Florida is worse than New York. No, New York is worse than Florida. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I screwed that up. You're right, Kevin. Florida, Florida I be sure. <laughs> Why are you dishing Florida? No, I mean, Florida it, it statistically is safer to be here in COVID times than New York just by the stats. More people are being hospitalized and more people are spreading COVID in the state of New York than in the state of Florida. With mandatory vaccines mm -hmm. and lockdowns and mm -hmm. mass mandates. And in Florida, there's none of that. And we're healthier. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, is, you know, is Cora, what is it? What's the phrase? Uh, causality, correlation, or correlation, yeah. causality? Who knows? I don't know that. I don't know yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, because how do you, what do you compare Florida to? It, you know, maybe New York because it's in it's colder. You're indoors. You're more likely to catch stuff indoors than outdoors. Maybe the stress of paying more taxes just causes your immune system to to dwindle, and that's why you get COVID more. I don't know. It could be so. Who knows what the causation correlation is there, George? We're ten minutes in. We haven't even talked about the news yet. <laughs> Let's move on quickly. No, no, Kevin, Kevin, yeah. we do. There is one item of personal news. Yes, that I think marks you as a true Floridian. You saw your first coyote. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I have enjoyed Florida wildlife. I've, I've done the gator, saw the gator, saw the live gator cross before me before. You got these big black rat snakes. I've seen my first rattlesnake. I was out for my bike ride on Sunday, burning off the calories from that extra turkey I had on Thanksgiving. And I had a coyote just dash right in front of the, the bicycles. I'm going down Highway uh, 748 here. And I'm like what <laughs> there are coyotes oh i also saw the florida bears before and it was amazing to see how quickly it dashed 
It started in a field on the other side of a barbed wire fence uh, that had no cattle in it. It dashed through the barbed wire fence, across the road, through another barbed wire fence without even slowing down. It, it, it's timing and running, and it was just amazing to see. Did I get a picture? No. Come on, it was just so fast. It's like you, you, when you're in the basement, you see that little mouse scurry off the side. Well, I'm never going to catch that one. Same with the coyote, which is a quick thing. No, no run, road runners from my youth involved. Um, it was just a, an amazing thing. So I, th I think I've seen all Florida has to offer. Got the dolphins, got the manatee. Yeah, I'm good. So yes, I'm Well, you know, good. Kevin, you're allowed to shoot coyotes. Uh, so you should take, uh, you should carry your rifle with you as you're, uh, as you're biking. And, uh, and the funny thing about Florida, that wouldn't gather any attention. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't stand out at all carrying my uh, whatever weapons I may or may not have on my, my back bicycle. George, let's move on to the news. Uh, China is a much bigger story than we could ever cover in one little episode. But um, China, for the longest time since Nixon went there, has been colonizing. And uh, they're not very good colonists. They have money to offer, and money is their colonizational solution. Uh, they build airports in Africa, highways in Africa. They're starting to uh, expand now into different parts of Europe, having financial influence. And I thought we could talk about this because there's a, a church realm to this. There's a realm that we deal with Hong Kong and other places, but my first impression here is china is not a good colonist colonizer you know the old phrase ugly american uh the old ugly american from the 1950s and 60s has nothing on the ugly chinese uh, overseas um there have been two incidents in the news uh, solomon islands that has uh, it's a it's a small island chains in the uh in the pacific um the government there recently moved its recognition from Taiwan to uh, Beijing, Peking. And in return, a big giant sports stadium was built in the capital, uh, Anurai, on the island of Guadalcanal. And the Chinese were given, uh, were, the, the government sold logging rights and fishing rights to the Chinese. Well, the fish, these, these are standard contracts. You know, you have to follow our wildlife and uh, environmental concerns. But what the Chinese do when they go fishing, uh, they basically suck every living creature out of the sea in the area where they're fishing. And this has caused the uh, some of the out islands, the people there to basically be up in arms, virulently anti-Chinese because their livelihood from fishing has been destroyed. Or the forest on their island, uh, which provided timber for their boats and whatnot has been completely leveled and chopped down in one blow and shipped off to China for their construction needs. Well, this past week, uh, yes, last week, uh, disquiet over Taiwan and versus Beijing, Peking broke out into riots. And these riots in the Solomon Islands led to the destruction of the Chinatown any Chinese business, Chinese grocery store, Chinese this and that, was set ablaze as the locals voiced their tremendous anger with the Chinese government and the way the Chinese treats locals. And the Archbishop, Anglican Archbishop, Anglicans are the largest religious group in the Solomon Islands, was on, on the radio and on air saying, please don't burn Chinese buildings, don't burn the parliament building, stay at home, let's work this out peacefully. Uh, those words really didn't catch. And as we still speak, the unrest, again, the anger at the Chinese for the exploitation of their natural resources in the Solomon Islands and for their taking advantage of the locals is just burning very hot. It is. Well, the Archbishop had the right response. We don't do that. Anglicans do not uh, uh, riot in that way. We don't uh, burn down uh, businesses and... Um, loot we get we very cross but <laughs> you know, we get up we get upset but we don't do that and i think that's the right response but um china's in this for the long game george you know, china doesn't care what's happening about today their game plan is 
decades and generations long. Yeah, China recently foreclosed on the Entebbe Airport. The Ugandan government took out a $200 million loan to upgrade the Entebbe Airport in Kampala, and they were laid on a loan payment, and it was a 25, 30-year loan, and the Chinese you know, foreclosed. And now the Chinese government basically controls the civil aviation, civil aviation sector of the Ugandan economy because they can decide how many slots to give British Airways on the mm -hmm. landing field and whatnot. And, and the how, much, how much to charge for charge. landing rights, yeah. And so, the, and we see this in, in, especially in Africa, the Chinese are rapacious uh, in their e exploitation of the locals economically, with raw mm. materials and whatnot. And there's, I, you know, there's been violence before in Zambia against the Chinese minority, Chinese traders. Uh, China, under its current government, just has decided we're going to stick our finger in the eye of the world. Because, uh, you know, coupled with the COVID stuff, coupled with threatening Taiwan with invasion, you've got this aggressive mercantilism that is not going to end well for everybody. No, it's it's amazing that their solution in colonization is hypercapitalism. We'll go in there with big loans. We'll make sure that people are uh, spending lots of money that they can't afford in other countries. Um, their weapon is hypercapitalism and, and loans. And that that's kind of strange for a communist country uh, where the, their state owns everything except for personal property, uh, personal mm. real estate property. So so the, the, the church in Africa, in the Pacific, where the Chinese are not being good neighbors, has urged calm and peace and not to take it out against the Chinese uh, shopkeeper down the street. But these, this is very, it's a bad situation. Yeah. And there's no easy answers because you're, you're fighting uh, polity uh, way beyond your borders. I, you know, and Africa needs the money. Of course, they're going to take money for the airport. Um, uh, a lot of good has come from micro loans that were uh, given out uh, in the last couple of decades. Yeah. I do have a good news story on this exact issue okay. and from the Church of England. So this is crazy time. World, <laughs> world's colliding, cats and dogs living together. Uh, the Bishop of St. Albans got up in Parliament in the House of Lords and urged the British government to boycott the Beijing Olympics over Beijing's treatment of the Uyghurs, the Muslims in Western China and Xinjiang. And I thought this was a remarkably good statement. I thought uh, the church, here's the church on the right side of an issue. And that's always a neat thing to see because usually the church is screwing this up. But kudos to the, the, the Bishop of Ecclesia uh, Bishop of St. Albans, for pointing out that uh, we should not uh, cooperate with a regime that is killing people just so that we can have uh, fun winter sports on TV. Well, I think China is going to succeed in what they're doing politically because over here in the West, we're fighting over climate change. We're fighting over uh, wokeism and critical race theory. We're rehashing... Um, the politics we've been fighting for two or three hundred years here in the West, and China's setting the goal: where do we want to be in a hundred years? Where do we want to be in two hundred years? What landmass do we want to create ourselves or invade? Um, I would say shortly after January, maybe February, uh, Russia will go into Ukraine, and uh, maybe next summer China will take Taiwan. Yeah. What's what I think makes it even harder for us is so many of our elites in this country are totally under the thumb of the Chinese. You know, we all know about the NBA basically being a National Basketball Association, being a an arm of the Chinese government. Um, but you know, Morgan Stanley's president, uh, Jamie Dimon, his chairman, made some joke at a meeting saying Morgan Stanley's going to be around longer than the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and he immediately, after this was publicized, climbed down and sang praises to the Chinese Communist Party. 
They had a Morgan Stanley, for goodness sakes. Now, how more capitalistic, how more, you know, robber baronish can you be than to be the head of the Morgan Stanley investment banking firm trying to appease the Chinese communists? Uh, I, and I hate to bring this up on Anglican Unscripted, but The Simpsons was released uh, through Netflix or Apple TV or whatever uh, in Hong Kong. And one of my favorite episodes, when I used to watch The Simpsons a long, long, long time ago, I've matured a little bit, uh, was the Tiananmen Square episode where they talked about uh, or referred to the atrocities at, T at Tiananmen Square. That episode didn't show up in the Hong Kong uh, podcast of The Simpsons, George. They, they took it out. What kind of influence does China have? Incredible influence. Uh, because... Your future as a business person and your future as a country is found in the population of future consumerists in China. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, this little communist country has a lot of uh, financial input. Let's move on and talk it's, some. It's uh, a big, big communist country, not a little <laughs> one, a big one. Oh, it's horrible. Uh, doom. All right, I moved on from my doom talk. Salvation Army is in the news. Uh, it's that time of year you walk up to your Target store, your Lowe's, your Home Depot, and out there is a person with a red kettle. And uh, if they're nice, they're just ringing the bell quietly. If they if they want your attention, they got the big kettle bell going back and forth because they take donations for the Salvation Army. And the, the Salvation Army has a, a, a great history of collecting money outside of stores. Uh, the most generous people give on the way in, People like myself give the change on the way out. I'm sorry, I'm a horrible person. Uh, however, I'm not giving the Salvation Army this year. I've, I'm uh, giving money elsewhere uh, because the Salvation Army has, for some reason, decided to become woke. And I don't need the people I give money to to uh, employ or perpetuate wokeness, George. Salvation Army put out a guide called Let's Talk About Racism. And the Salvation Army Guide encouraged white donors to its causes, be it clothing or money or food, to apologize for their whiteness and think about what it has done to the world. Now, this, this study guide, uh, you know, it's no different from the stuff that we're seeing in the public schools. It's critical race theory. Um, that the great evil in this world is white racism and so on and so forth and that white males uh, between 50 and 60 are the greatest evil in the world well the, the Salvation Army drank the Kool-Aid as well but there was a backlash and the backlash began at the kettles uh, this year for some reason the, the word has gotten out that the Salvation Army has gone over to the other side now, in the past, the Salvation Army was noted for being one of the most lean and honorable charities, meaning its directors, unlike, say, Goodwill, didn't rake in million-dollar salaries or the American Red Cross. United the money Way. You gave, <laughs> United Way. The money you gave went to the needy and the poor, both here and in abroad. Mm -hmm. now, they've, now they've politicized the whole thing, and so the Salvation Army... Uh, I think on, the, on, on Thanksgiving Day or the day after, put out a statement saying, oh, well, people have misinterpreted our racism document, and we'd like to talk about uh, issues, and but people have misinterpreted it, so we're going to withdraw this statement. So they're climbing down quickly because there was a backlash that hit them financially from, their, from the donors. Um, but... Uh, Gosh, Kevin, to think the Salvation <laughs> Army has gone over to the dark side, I, too. You know, it, it just, what, things we grew up with that we thought were just pure, that never change. Yeah, okay, there would always be the annoying bells outside the store. Um, but if I, get, if I gave them my quarters, pennies, dollars, you know, whatever, I knew it was going to end up in the hands of those who needed it. Now I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm afraid if I give money to the Salvation Army, it's going to end up in tracts and teachings about critical race theory, and that they're going to uh, completely lose their focus on helping the poor and those in need and helping those who 
have been created kind of this this social construct and excuse me let me get a cat off the counter get down what are you doing ha <laughs> you didn't even see that and i wasn't mean to the cat i just gave him a little push but to see what quick, are... you know critical race theory is not something we need to have taught anymore it's been debunked one of our viewers who uh is in touch with us with some interesting news from time to time sent us a little study i don't know where it was from so i can't really confirm it but they looked at the bishops of the church of england who are on twitter and the question was how many weeks has it been since you tweeted the name jesus christ and there's some bishops who are on twitter 10 times a day who haven't in three or four years mentioned the word jesus um well it's, but it's worse know, than that not have they not mentioned that they have not retweeted a story about jesus they've not you know had any type of messaging where they went to uh other tweets about jesus it just it, there's just no jesus at all in the, in the twitter verse of the church of england now, now we should point out that the archbishop of canterbury is the outlier justin welby does tweet about jesus um so there you know credit where credit is due absolutely he does use his he does use his pulpit to talk about jesus he also talks about other stuff i don't care for but he does do it right but like i mentioned martin warner the bishop chichester it's been three years or something i don't know the exact number of weeks since he's talked about uh he's had an unap un unapologetic jesus you know tell tells us type tweet what's a bishop supposed to be doing with twitter Oh, I know. He's. They're supposed to be saying, uh, "Don't never, never, never trust a Tory," uh, like that woman in Saint, uh, the Bishop of Saint David's, I think it was. Oh, just as an aside, friends, uh, the Bishop, the Bishop of Saint David's, who took a voluntary leave of absence for health reasons, is now back on, back on duty again after three months, suffering from the ill effects of being caught out as a political hack. But I don't know if she's been cured or not. Well, let's. <sighs> You brought up bishops in the church. I think we need to talk about that um, because we've complained about how they choose their bishops. When Gavin was on the program, he said it was, I mean, use the word ass night, how uh, the, the Church of England chooses bishops. And basically it's a committee and they've been doing it wrong for a long time. And you can see that in the, the fruit of their current bishop stock. I have seen a story this week that says they're taking it. Some people will say maybe it's a better choice than having a committee, but they're allowing school children to choose bishops. And this is hard to report on because people, because of the, the color of one's skin, may think we're speaking of this in a, in a, in a level of race. We're not. We're speaking of this in the level of how do we choose those who serve the church at the bishop level. So, George, I'm going to throw the story to you. Um, number one rule of Anglican scripted is don't be the story. So, what, what, what can we do here without getting ourselves in trouble? A little bit of context. Mm -hmm. There are different ways in which churches around the world select bishops. They're elected, they're appointed, they're you know, just every way you can think of. One way that involves children is the patriarch or the pope of the Coptic Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. A list of candidates is put into a hat, if you will, and a child comes forward and picks a name out of a hat, meaning, and I think the, the Serbian Orthodox does that as well. It is done by chance or by lot. Well, the Church of England is experimenting with this child-friendly way of doing it. And the Bishop of Willesden, which is a Suffragan bishop in the Diocese of London, Pete Broadbent was bishop there for 20 odd years. Uh, Sarah Mullally decided to do things differently. She got a short list, if you will, of people. And then that she went to some, uh, what they call black, B-A-M-E, Black, African, Middle East, whatever, ethnic school children, uh, non-white schoolgirls specifically. Mm -hmm. And they gave the list and the qualifications and had the girls listen to the sermons and readings of the candidates they chose. And to the surprise of essentially nobody, 
the preteen uh, of African descent schoolgirls picked uh, Canon Lusa uh, Ngoya, Ngosa Ngoy, who is originally from the Congo, to be the next bishop. Uh, he's a advocate of critical race theory. Uh, he has never uh, tweeted about Jesus that people are aware of. You can see the committee that uh, selected him with the Bishop of uh, London. Now, our correspondents, our friends in England have written to us basically, uh, I don't want to say outraged because it was so predictable, but the sheer utter tokenism we need to have a black bishop so let's have black schoolgirls make the selection for us and we can sh basically have the fig leaf that the holy spirit is moving amongst the church because we're doing it like the coptic orthodox i'm sorry if you had uh, 17 white boys from alabama and you gave them a list to pick from i don't think you would have gotten the same choice if it was the same candidates you know people come out of their cultural and uh context with the bishop like them um there's there, there, there's a built-in bias absolutely now i i step back and i say they couldn't do any worse than they were doing before you know the the system they were doing before has just destroyed the church of england in, in its episcopacy and leadership so if, if they want to try something new even something this new go for it because you're not going to do any worse it's impossible to do any worse than you've already well maybe not but it, <laughs> in context what they were doing wasn't working and i don't think they could have done any worse that's my, my point here well this leads into another story mm -hmm. uh and this is not my running away from commenting on this <laughs> but i think it's all tied together it is all tied. luke appleton who uh is a lay delegate to general synod from the diocese of exeter wrote a piece on the recent meeting of Synod uh, for Ang and it appeared on Anglican Inc. And he talked about the bigger, the issues that got the uh, press's attention was the sort of public show by gay members of Synod about we're going to stand in solidarity for Ghana. And then the big debates about the save the parish uh, system. And he said, what was really though interesting was that when we came to talk about governance of Synod, Everybody sort of left to go to the bathroom or go get a cup of coffee. And the Synod Chamber was almost empty. That's an exaggeration. But the Synod Chamber was not as packed. And what was shared was that the Church of England leaders believe that democracy isn't working in General Synod. In other words, we're not getting the people we want. It's not diverse enough. It's not having the diversity we would like to see. And therefore, we want the center, the bureaucracy, now to vet candidates or to vet people before they can stand for synod so that we get the synod we want. And they then went on to say, and there's too much dispersed authority. There's too many people with responsibilities. And if we centralize things, it'll make things more efficient and cost effective. Now, where does this tie in to Canon uh, Bishop Lusa, uh, the new bishop? Well, this new bishop will have no authority whatsoever. He'll be a, basically a token, a figurehead, not a person of substance, because the plan of the Welbyites running General Synod in the Church of England is to suck every bit of power and authority into a center. So when you have no when a bishop has no real power, no real standing, no real authority, it doesn't matter who they are. You can have a sheer token appointment that you do so you have pretty pictures with school kids because this guy doesn't mean for anything or stand for anything and what he has to say means nothing. What is important are the is are the men in the back room and women calling the shots and the Church of England is pursuing an avowedly anti-democratic approach of consolidating power into an unelectable, un unchallengeable clique in the middle. But we've seen uh, this before with the Church of England. Uh, we will have in Daba, we will talk until you agree with me. Now it's, mm -hmm. we will have votes until the vote is right. Until there's mm -hmm. a vote that we can have we, where the vote is done in the correct way. 
and it's not by the democratic majority process it's by um, we need to wear you down because you just don't understand and if you did understand you would vote our way and th that's we, we've hit that time now in the Church of England um, it's it's beyond Indaba <laughs> they, they couldn't win with Indaba they're gonna go the, the next route and stack the deck you know with, with people well, who agree with them and this is the this is the argument that's been revolving on a recent story about the Archbishop of Khartoum mm -hmm. the Archbishop of Khartoum has said let's while we still can while we still have the critical numbers in a Lambeth session let's all go in fight and break the system mm -hmm. and recreate it and against that is the argument uh, Jeff Jeff Walton one of our regular faces on this show uh, said you know there's also a sense among many bishops that it's too late that if you even play the game you'll get you'll get taken um, it's it's a game of if you will it's a church three card monte out in front of grand central station pick a card any card and uh, you'll always get the card the dealer wants you to have so i if i knew the answer of course i'd be rich and famous yeah no. uh, but and but we uh, we want to do the story without making it about race i want to mm -hmm. do the story about you know white school children uh, picking their favorite sermon speaker um, this just happened to be different. You have to understand, George and I belong to the Anglican Communion, which is majority, vast majority, African. And we love that. We, we have no problem with that at all. This is not about race. This is about how the Church of England is deciding to choose their leaders. And good and luck with that. <laughs> and I would argue this is more racist because it's exploiting yeah. race as symbolism mm -hmm. and token. Yeah. rather than allowing individuals no matter what their race or background or what have you who are brothers and sisters in christ to stand forward and exercise leadership instead of doing that they pick these arbitrary human constructs okay we need to have this color face or that color face or this you know this sex or that sex rather than the best man or the best woman Maybe we can't even say that anymore. Maybe yeah. the best. Well, we can't uh, because you just. Whatever, whichever you, number of sexes there are, 52, 53. Uh, you can't make this a binary system. Okay. We are a non-binary world. And thank God the Church of, Eng Church of Canada has come to our rescue to put out some liturgies for uh, trans affirmation. And so, hey, it's going to hit our news desk if the church does anything outlandish or godly and we will let you decide which this was george what is the story out of canada well i'm a little proud of myself because we were basically the first news outlet apart from the canadian house in-house press service to push this out there and it, uh, it, it was it, hold on it was buried it was buried in gobbledygook it, in gobbledygook <laughs> and you you had to have masochists like Kevin and George who read the gobbledygook until they find a nugget of gold in all the dross. And so we pulled it out and pushed it out into the, inter into the uh, uh, internet. Well, this got picked up uh, by lots of different people uh, from uh, this, in the secular press as well as commentators like Rod Dreher. So the story is out there, so you may have heard it, but. Kevin and I want to take tiny little claim of sort of teeing this up for the big boys to drive down the fairway. Canadians have come up with a liturgy so that when you change, so that we become a man or if a woman or something in between. If you were born in the wrong body, you can have affirmation of the church for changing your gender. And you can and you can be affirmed, and we can apologize for that very mean statement, male and female. He created them. You know, we're going to affirm you that God really didn't mean that. If you're Canadian, um, it it's as loosey goosey, crazy, silly as it comes. And Rod Dreher's article on this point was not so much to go into the details of the liturgy, but to say this is symbolic of the decline 
of the Anglican Church of Canada and much of Western liberal theology, that it is no longer focused on Jesus Christ or his salvation. It's focused on the in inessentials, the, the silliness, the things that are not saving. Uh, well, I, I, to the exclusion gonna, of the gospel. I'm going to make an observation. I've traveled the country extensively in the last uh, 19 months in my RV with my wife, going to national parks, going and meeting campers and going to restaurants and uh, traveling all around here. And I have to say there is a noticeable pal palpability of the difference of the 15 to 35 year old male from a decade ago and now. Uh, they are, for all intents and purposes, and I hate to use this word, more effeminate. And I, you, I, I don't understand how this happened so quickly. Do we have no male role models? Do we have, uh, is there nobody that they can look to that can raise them in a masculine way? Well, it's women teachers. Well, not really. I was raised by women teachers. I, I turned out masculine. <laughs> I, I, I don't know the answer. Is it the internet? Are, are we so narcissistic now that you know we're, we're so con concerned about our image that it's causing uh, males to be more effeminate? I, I don't know. But I want to put that out there as that it is a real problem out there. People don't understand their gender. And Kevin, it's something I've noticed going to general conventions of the Episcopal Church is the feminization of the church as an institution. Mm -hmm. I don't mean there's anything wrong with women leaders. I am not particularly exercised on that point. But what I am saying is the whole sense of the masculine element of life is being deliberately exercised from the life of the church. Mm -hmm. um, where does it come from? Somebody, some people might say divorce culture with fathers not at home. I, you know, I'm not a sociologist. I don't know. I can only look at the results. And well, here's a, and and maybe also changing social mores. Maybe Kevin. Maybe I'm looking at things badly. But I'm going to a wedding this weekend. My daughter's roommate from college is getting married. And they, she's my daughter's been out of college now for three, four years. And this is the first of her friends, her circle, to get married. And at Susan and I, my wife and I, were commenting in our time in the 80s, oh, I don't want to say almost everybody, but essentially three quarters of our group were married within three, four, five years of graduating from college. Mm -hmm. um, this new generation uh, is postponing marriage farther out. It's you know, the men are not taking the responsibilities uh, the way they once were, society once encouraged them to do so. Yeah, it, you know, same, you know, we're about the same age. A, a couple years here or there, we're not going to tell who's younger or older. I just look older. Look, yeah, I got the gray, clearly I'm older. But when I was 25 <laughs> or 26, um, I'm All, the older of the two. I'm the big boy. Yeah. Uh, I'll uh, die first. So. <laughs> when I was 26, 27, all my friends who should have been married were married. The the immature ones who should never have gotten married were starting to get married. So, you know, I own my first, I, I paid for and bought my own house when I was 25. I don't see that happening, you know, out there. I, I don't see any things that were signs of the coming of age for us in the eighties happening now for this generation. Yeah. Well, it's also the parents fault. I still pay the car insurance for my kids. <laughs> We've had and conversations. Lord, and my daughter and my daughter makes more than I do. Oh my, uh, mm -hmm. but, but there is a, the feminization of society as, um, Oh, I know this is going to sound silly and cranky, but to me, it's like the bicycle helmet uh, craze of you know having to protect your child from every possible problem. Mm -hmm. um, I never wore a bicycle helmet, and maybe that's why I've got all these problems. <laughs> but you know, just but the, the the mania 
of safety, of protecting, of cocooning, whether it's 30 years ago in bicycle helmets or whether it's today in COVID vaccines. Mm -hmm. I'm not against vaccines. I'm just against this mindset of uh, coerced, enforced uh, conformity. Now, I want to make the opposite observation as well. I'm not seeing machoism breaking out among feminism more than it had existed already 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, it's, I, I see uh, masculinity be taken out of the male uh, characteristic. I don't see machoism, and I'm using the, the wrong Latin root for that, sorry, uh, tr being flowing into the, the, the feminists. So I, I, I want to put that observation out there. And now I'm turning to you, the audience. What do you think is causing this? Um, and, and root causes, something that we as a society or as a church can take a look at and address. Um, because God did make us male and female. And it was in his intention for us to be, um, I go, I'm going to use a word. If I'm banned by YouTube, it's this word. God intended us to be binary. Oh, ouch. Ooh. Oh, sorry. So that, that's, that's, that's all the news I got here for this week, George. Do you got any, do you got any non Indian stories you want to talk about? I'm looking over the list. Well, there is a neat Indian story. Uh, nope, 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 a nope, continuing nope. a continuing Anglican bishop in okay. India was arrested for selling church property that belonged to the Church of North India. Uh, so not only are the Indian bishops selling their own, they for, he forged a power of attorney and sold off a church that belonged to the Diocese of Amritsar. Uh, wow, that's a new level of corruption. That you, you, we joke here and there about Indian corruption. That's a new level. And this is what's a continuing bishop. And here's the thing, uh, in the continuing world, uh, the enemy is the Episcopal Church, the Church of England. And sometimes alliances or fellowships are made with these guys in India and friends in the US check these guys references. <laughs> well, <laughs> Some no, of them the... are crooks. I heard rumors, it was probably two years ago, uh, a couple of people uh, mentioned to me that GAFCON was looking to have some affiliation with some diocese in, in India. And I'm like, who wants, give me those bishops' names. We need to talk to them. Uh, I can't think of anybody right now who GAFCON should have a relationship with in India. Uh, because that bishop itself may not be crooked. But the diocese or the mechanisms, the financials, some, the, the, the levels of corruption are so great. And it's a societal issue. It's not just a church issue that uh, um, you really need to do your research and homework before you have uh, a diocese to diocese or diocese to province relationship with anybody in India. One of the things Kevin and I have done over the years is people have written to us saying, Bishop so-and-so from this African country has asked us to help him with this orphanage. Mm -hmm. uh, and, oh, the people have told us he's wonderful. And we're able to write back saying, well, he has been charged with embezzling, uh, using money to, designed to pay for a school building to buy a car for his himself. Yeah. Um, I hate but to hate to hate to dissuade hate to dissuade people from su supporting the church overseas but you need to be cautious and check because some of these guys are crooks we did this i'm not going to mention the ministry's name but there's a, a very uh, well-known ministry here in america it's an international ministry that was having a speaker and the speak the main speaker was crooked and we contacted that ministry it's like three or four years ago now and made them aware and they canceled that speaker and um, they didn't know. But no, they made them aware so that they did their investigation. That's right. It they, wasn't yeah, because they, on no, our it wasn't us. No, they, they, they were made aware and they did their, absolutely. We don't have that type of influence. Thank God. <laughs> Thank you, Father. All right, George, that is episode 704. Um, you can't meet on Thursday or Friday. You're, you're traveling. I'll be in Kentucky at a wedding. Cool. I, First I trip to Kentucky. 
<laughs> you don't like whiskey, but if you ever get a chance to do the uh, uh, some of the tours up there, they're, they're a lot of fun. Uh, have a safe trip to Kentucky. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 704 of Anglican Unscripted.